This morning on the show, we shall be looking at a very important issue which is dear to my heart and indeed I believe is dear to the hearts of many Ghanaians, if not the entire um, Ghanaian community. And I'm talking about the issue of the country's health emergency response system. So we shall have this in focus. Now, the commissioning and distribution of the ambulances parked at the State House could not happen on the 6th of January 2020, that is this Monday, as promised by the President. And the reason for this is because the National Ambulance Service, through the Ministry of Health, wrote to the President to request for a postponement of this scheduled activity. Now, in a letter written and signed by the CEO of the National Ambulance Service, the CEO stated five reasons uh, why the planned commissioning and distribution should be temporarily halted. Uh, the National Ambulance Service um, request was made against the backdrop of a number of preparatory activities which should have been completed prior to the set commissioning and distribution. But of course, these preparatory activities were behind schedule. Now, it's no doubt that ambulance services uh, are an integral part of a health emergency response system. But of course, there are other aspects of the response or emergency response system which ought to be functional for us to have the full benefit of the health emergency response system. On the show this morning, we shall be looking at this very important issue. We have empaneled experts in the sector to educate us on exactly what it is we should have as a country when it comes to our healthcare emergency response system. Then we'll turn our attention to another matter which is of great importance, particularly as we approach the 2020 polls, and I'm talking about the voters register debate. Now this debate over um, plans to compile a new voters register for the 2020 general elections continues to rage on. Now while a coalition of about six political parties um, calling itself the inter-party resistance against the new voters register are, as their name suggests, against the plan by the EC to compile a new voters register, another coalition of about 13 political parties are in favour of the EC's plan to compile a new voters register. Now the coalition of six political parties have this week served notice that they will be organising a series of um, demonstrations dubbed Yempene demonstrations in major cities of the country uh, to put pressure on the Electoral Commission to rescind its decision to compile a new voters register. And they are saying that to date, the EC has failed to give any tenable reasons or justifications for the compilation of a new voters register. Indeed, the first of their demonstrations is scheduled to kickstart this morning in Tamale. Now, it's about 11 months to the 2020 general elections, and some of the anti new register proponents, including policy think tank CDD, argue that there is no need for a new voters register. On the show this morning, we shall be considering the arguments for both uh, for and against the compilation of a new voters register. And we encourage you to send through your comments as well on this issue um, to our WhatsApp number 020216663, which will be displayed on the screen shortly or as we go along with the program. We have with us a panel of experts within the sector who will throw some more light on this issue to see where we are at exactly as a country in terms of our emergency response system. I'll introduce to you the panel for this conversation. From my extreme left, we have uh, Samuel Arthur. He is a health analyst. Next is Bright Emi Sanyako. He is the national vice chairperson of the coalition of NGOs in health. And to my right, we have Professor Fred Binker. He is a professor of epidemiology and the former vice, um, vice chancellor, sorry, of the University of Health and Allied Sciences. And last but not least, we have Dr. Titus Bayou. 
He is the Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. Good morning, gentlemen, and welcome to the show. It is, it's a pleasure and a privilege to have you join me um, on the show to discuss this all-important subject. Um, I think in recent times we've had cause to complain about our <coughs> emergency response system as a country. Indeed, it's one of the burning issues that we keep discussing. But it has come to the fore uh, in recent times, obviously because of the um, ambulances parked currently at the State House. But this morning's conversation obviously is going to look beyond just the ambulances parked at the State House. We're looking at the bigger context, looking at how, as a country, we plan for emergencies, and which is why I'm happy to have um, the panel that we have this morning. So we'll start off with an understanding of where we are at as a country. And um, I will turn to, I want to start this conversation with Professor Binka. And um, if you could just give us an idea, um, perhaps I, my, my question would be, how would you assess our current situation in terms of our healthcare emergency response system? And then we take it up from there. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I would say our current system is a bit rudimentary. We are now starting to develop the issue of emergency medicine. You should also remember that we've started as a country in an area with infectious diseases, and now we are making a transition to uh, non-communicable or chronic diseases, mm. which includes all the other <coughs> diseases that we are all aware of, hypertension, diabetes, and, and the cardiovascular diseases that require us to have emergency care. Right. They, unlike um, the infectious diseases where you actually do have emergencies, but um, not the kind of emergencies that we, we are talking about today. First of all, uh, in the non-communicable diseases sector, uh, death comes very quickly, especially with cardiovascular diseases. The person collapses within a short time, uh, you've, you've lost the person. Right. In the past, there also were the major emergencies were road traffic accidents, we had obstetric emergencies where women had to deliver and so on. And th these numbers were good, but they, were, they have been compounded by this new burden mm. of disease. Mm. And that's why we're having uh, 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 in, in the emergency systems to be built. In fact, when I was training as a, uh, a doctor, Kolebu didn't have an, uh, an uh, accident mm. and emergency center. Uh, most of those cases went to the polyclinic, and we went to do the triage in the polyclinic and then moved them onto the ward. But now most decent hospitals have an uh, em accident and emergency center. Right. So that's where we're going. And we need to plan this in such a way that we address the needs of the situation, the, the current situation that we have. Sorry to cut in here, but I'm, I'm hearing from you, you use the word rudimentary to describe you know, cur our current state. And I'm also hearing from you, a suggestion that well it's 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 work in progress as it were that yes. we are getting there yeah. the question is considering how far we've come as a country um over 60 years of independence is do you think rudimentary is the best way to use to define our emergency response system as a country well um uh, if i take I, I think most people could look at the situation in accra so in accra you have the military you have uh, Kolebu, the teaching hospital, mm -hmm. and then you have the regional hospitals, uh, REACH and others. We don't have a coordinated right. uh, link between these uh, groups in such a way that they will anticipate what the emergencies are, who will specialize in what, and how we will build this up. We need that cohesion mm -hmm. uh, because we don't have as many resources as available. So. If we planned it in such a way that there is some coordination, then that's the way to go. At the moment, they are all developing in their own direction, depending on the resources their agencies okay. do have. We've just added the Legon Center and others that are coming on board. So that's why I'm saying that um, I don't see a network that is being built to make us stronger to be able to deal with the problem. Right. Yes. Very well, thank you. Now, let me turn to the um, Vice Chair of the Coalition of NGOs in Health. Uh, right. I asked Doc a question about, you know, the use of the word rudimentary. That's his, his assessment. Obviously, I, I believe we, we, we all share in that, that it's not in the best of shapes. But my question is, 
do you think over the years we have prioritized, you know, health care in the country for that matter, looking at our emergency response within that sector? Yeah, thank you very much, Abina, and good morning to your viewers. I think uh, health as one of the sectors, um, I cannot say it's never been prioritized, but in, from one government to the other, everybody chooses where it, it, it focuses on, um, depending on um, what the country's need might be to that particular government. For us, we think um, we would have, could have done some more mm. if we had uh, you know, seen health together with the emergency situations we are looking at today to be our priority as a country. Um, I would just say, if you look at our country policies, do we have an emergency preparedness plan? And what is the strategy? What is in it for us? Who are the teams to look at these issues? These are concerns that come to us at community level actors. So we are doing what we think we can do, but we think it's not a, a, the best. We could do some more mm. to, to prioritize and give health, health care. When somebody is healthy, the person should be able to do a lot of things for right. him or herself. Right. So to, to us, it's not the best of a priority. Now. Right. Now, let me quickly chip in here that we um, had scheduled to have um, the CEO of the National Ambulance Service join us in the person of Dr. Ahmed Zakaria, but unfortunately, that couldn't happen. So we don't have him here uh, to speak to the issues. Indeed, you, 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 you would agree with me that when it comes to emergency response system, ambulance services is... is you know, plays a very, very integral role in there. So it would have been good to have had him here, but we we'll carry on nonetheless. Um, now, now, Samuel, you're a health analyst, and I, I mean, for, for the preliminary <coughs> stage of this discussion, I'd want you to also give me your assessment of our, you know, current um, 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 emergency health care system, a response system. Yeah, uh, thanks, Abna, and I, I guess I also want to take this opportunity to wish your viewers a happy new year. Mm. I guess Prof rightly uh, has done a great assessment. I don't want to do that. We are quite at the rudimentary stage. Mm. The, there's a lot that can be done, but the striking issue which I wanted to raise is exactly what Prof has raised, but I will extend it a bit to the community. I mean the beneficiaries of health service or healthcare delivery. Like he's saying, we're developing a, a, a system which virtually finds all the players acting on their own. Mm. And it's important that we begin to look at the wires that we can connect each of them together. What can make it possible? Is it possible we could use technology to, to get to link all these major centers that are receiving emergency cases? Now, even before that, we are looking at the very periphery of the periphery where the cases are coming from. For example, in the community, what is the emergency response system within the community? Now, before we even talk about the ambulance, where is the sighting of the CHIPS center? Does everybody in the community have knowledge of where that CHIPS center is? Is the community aware and educated enough to know what actions, what quick actions they need to take? For example, if a woman is in labor, within the community, who are the quick community actors we could fall upon? Even before the healthcare personnel comes into the picture, can we use telephony to get to, to, to pick people within this lane to make sure this system is, is, is working? Now, within the CHIP Center, also to the next, probably the district hospital, what is the linkage? Can we use telephony also to break that gap? What, what, what can we take advantage of so that there's that seamless movement within and then you are not sure that you may be short chain? Of course, you are able to move from the community to the CHIPS. And if you are not able to get the kind of support that you need, it means you need to be referred. Now, what's the link? Even before that situation is up, what will be the next step for that healthcare personnel at the CHIPS, linking that to the district hospital? So if there's a need for referral, that can be done. So I agree with Prof. And I guess we need to begin to look at building that synergy, closing the gaps and getting that seamless chain. But of course, that will not be successful if the community, the periphery, you know, the, the, the beneficiaries of the service, if they do not know what to do. Right. That awareness is in there. Now, Doc, Dr. Bayer, yeah. quickly, um, <coughs> clearly it's coming out that the issue we have when it comes to, you know, the emergency response system has to do with coordination or if you like a lack of that coordination 
which is essential to ensuring that you know the system gels and yeah. everything works seamlessly and also the community level which is what um someone just introduced from the ghana medical association standpoint what do you think can be done to enhance or to help you know this coordination or lack of coordination which obviously is the problem all right um, thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you for having me i think um the gma has had concern on the state of our emergency preparedness health wise and we have made suggestions over the years that just as prof said the structure is not well coordinated mm -hmm. and um, we think that if you can break down the whole thing into pre-hospital care and then intra-hospital care and how we coordinate all of this together from our point of view if you look at the in-hospital care we need to build capacity we need emergency physicians we need them around the country distributed well and we need to increase the capacity of the hospitals to handle emergencies. You see a 2,000 bed capacity hospital and an emergency segment is four beds mm. or 10 beds. And what is the bed bureau management? All this must be integrated with the help of IT so that we know that if, if you have 2,000 beds, you have 10 emergency beds, where are the empty beds? Where can you sort out issues? And this must be integrated. Now, when you come to pre-hospital care, just as they mentioned, the community awareness must be there. And health is cross-cutting. So transportation system must be efficient. The issue of ambulances will come in. Communication. I mean, we've had a situation where we said there must be a national call center backed by solid IT infrastructure. Right. That tells us if you are within Greater Accra region, these are the hospitals. At this very moment, if you call into that center, they can tell you if you have an obstetric emergency, Kolebu can receive you, Rich can receive you, this place cannot receive you. If you have this emergency, this specialist is there. You know, this can be done real time. And that system must be well coordinated. And all this must be backed by solid investment. Mm. We have described the state of our emergency as an emergency. It's virtually in crisis. <laughs> then it's yes, a, it's a, yeah. yes it's, it's virtually in crisis because um, the emergency healthcare system is the equator. Unfortunately, primary health care, you have a choice. People can fly out, people can go elsewhere. But when it comes to emergency, everybody, whether you are resident or not resident in the country, once you're within the periphery of the country and you have an emergency, you are subject to whatever is available to you. Mm -hmm. you know? So for coordination, we have to look at it in those facets. Mm -hmm. Pre-hospital, how do we go around it? Intra-hospital, how do we go around it? And how do we link this? with solid infrastructure, IT infrastructure, right. that allows people to access this. And that should be, bound, um, uh, be supported by adequate education. The public must know. I mean, when you go to the basic level, you realize that our emergency response is terrible. What do we see if somebody collapses? People will scream around, exactly. pour water on the person, exactly. apply all sorts of creams before thinking of even checking if the person is alive or dead, mm -hmm. before thinking of, is there CPR? So our movies never demonstrate CPR. Mm -mm. So the education must go... That's not a part of us. Yes. Really. So the education must go all the way. So when he talks about awareness and the community being involved, it must not only be government. It must be an entire mm. community approach. Mm. So that from our entertainment point where we can get the ears and the eyes, people should be educated about emergency response mm -hmm. in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So that when there's an emergency, what do you do? What number can you call? first responder what can you do right. so i think that coordination is what is lacking right so and consistently i believe over the years these have been the issues we've discussed consist question is and i think i'll throw that to prof yeah. what in your estimation is the reason why we are unable to get i'm not saying get the ideal situation because obviously the ideal situation i don't think it's that's utopic <laughs> yeah. but at least to the point where we will get our emergency response system out of an emergency, mm. as Doc, Doc, Doc describes it. What, what is it that is keeping us from getting to that minimum standard, which, you know, would, we would say, well, we are not there yet, but at least we are managing with this. And in the sense of management, we're saying at least it's fit for purpose. What is it that is keeping us? So there are several answers that we sure. provide, but <laughs> for me... I think when you are in the state of developing something, um, you need to bring everybody on board. 
so that you know what resources you have. Mm -hmm. And it, as they say, you cut your coat according to the, the size That's of your cloth. cloth. So depending on what we have, if we were talking, if we were bringing people around the table to have these things done, and in fact, if you read about the history of the emergency services and so on, uh, this approach of a national system is also a problem yeah. because the needs of different sectors of the community as they develop is different. So Accra Tema area mm -hmm. has a, a unique right. situation yeah. which you can't just transplant into other places. So why can't the actors who are in this area sit down to talk? Yeah. You know, so that's one. If we talk and we take account of our resources, there are simple things that don't need money. Yeah that will allow us. He just talked about uh, making sure that you know the best situation, you know where to go. That kind of information doesn't need any money. It just needs the right people to be around the table and agree that this is where we are today. We, own, we aim for the, the best, but as of today, these are our resources and this is how we can deploy those resources. Right. Uh, the third thing is, if you look at that, you also determine what kind of services, uh, emergency services do we want? If you take the ambulance, for example, if I were in charge of uh, trying to support the emergency services in my district, I would prefer motorbikes than um, these ambulances, mm. okay? And even in Accra, sometimes are you trying to send the service to the patient or in this case, all we are trying to do is to take the patient to the service. There are two forms of this and you can bring the service to the patient or you can them. take at the moment we are taking the patient always to the, to the, service. To, 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 to the hospital <laughs> but if a woman wants to deliver you need a midwife the midwife can deliver the woman at her place home. everybody will be happy yeah. and life will go on but now we are complicating it by taking getting the whole community mobilized to carry this woman who will deliver on the way to hospital sure. huh? So these are some of the, the, the problems that we have to look at. So Let we have, to look, we have sure. to look at what we have. What is the purpose of what we are trying to do? Okay. I think perhaps the, the, the fundamental question is, do we have, as a nation, a plan? Do we have? I think that's, that should have been the first question, really. <laughs> do we have at all that we are working towards? <laughs> So as a blueprint, this is what is guiding yes. us. Or we just, you know, as and when we decide anything, then we just that chip in sense. something here and there. Do so we have, to, your, to the so best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, in this age, when you have a plan, it must be on the, your, your website. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's where we are today. Mm. In, in my time, <coughs> you have to go and look for a book or something. Right. I went to the website. I didn't find any document. Which website? The Ghana Health Service? Or the Ghana Health Service, <coughs> the ambulance service, the ministry. I, the ministry. Uh, maybe they have it sitting somewhere on the shelf. Yeah, yeah so, maybe. So I can't say for you this when no one knows it. <laughs> when the key actors don't know it. Doc, do you know of any such plan? Uh, not that I know of. Not that you know <laughs> of. That In fact, we, made, we, we have called several times for this coordinated approach, mm -hmm. as Prof yeah. mentioned. Because the needs are really different. And if there is a plan the key actors in this plan must know it mm -hmm. and know the rules we play mm -hmm. i'm an obstetrician gynecologist what role do i play in this plan i'm a at a receiving center where people will bring emergencies to me how how do i fit into this plan if as long as i don't know it if it exists then it's useless right <laughs> you know definitely that that is quite worrying yes <laughs> and, and samuel you want you want to chip in something yes Abna, i guess i i, I may be visiting dr berry's earlier point which mm -hmm. is talking about real investments within the health sector <laughs> and and for me coming as a also as a community actor i i, I we have monitored over time and we see that even the minimum which we signed on to at abuja several mm. years back where we were supposed to commit about at least 15 percent mm. of our total uh, budget expenditure on health that has never happened you know so then it tells you what premium of value we put on our health so we are not doing the real investment in there now so facilities are not up where you even have the building or the structure the the, the supplies and manpower and that is not in place because of, like you said, the lack of the coordination bit. But the real thing is about the real investments. Do we, do, if we had continued to invest 15% over a 10 year period, 
where would we have gotten to? Would we have waited to a point where now we need to bring in over some number of ambulances and they are coming in and we are waiting for them to be commissioned like we have never had ambulances before? Could we have just had them so they come and fit into the system? So, so and even the way it is structured now, we are looking at they've been assigned to constituencies. And I see a disalignment here sure. because the, the health system does not recognize the constituencies. They are, it's within the district health Mm -hmm. structure so we have the district health management team so i'm looking at if it's in the constituency how will it be allocated will who will be managing it and that which so raises it, issues so about the plan exactly <laughs> exactly so, so it brings us to, but but the one striking issue is about investments and mm -hmm. carmen is still looking at uh, the curative bit where we need to build facilities like he's saying is there a way that we can get the the service to the that whoever needs the service at the point even at at their doorstep is it possible? Can we look at how we can mm -hmm. do that? We've seen community health nurses come into the system, but we're asking what, what level of services or range of services are they giving within the community? Right. But one set of critical actors we have ignored are the civil society actors. I mean, NGOs within the communities who are virtually supposed to be virtually the gatekeepers between the healthcare providers and the immediate community because they have some kind of training, some specialization to understand the health system and they are supposed to be the link that we could get information from the health system to get into the community. Government continues to invest and we see that investment coming in the way of NGOs, civil society actors who are supposed to be leading the preventive healthcare bit so we are not inundated by several cases at the receiving end. Mm. That is missed out. And we need to, as we begin to, 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 to ask for more resources within the health sector, we need to look at which bit we can also channel to facilitate the work of these real actors who are also very important. Mm. The community actors here, I mean the NGOs, the civil society organizations that are supposed to bridge that gap between the facility and them. <laughs> right, and great. Right, now, quick one. When, in, in looking at this whole, you know, arrangement to see how best we can get it, functioning seamlessly. Coordination has come up, uh, the, you know, the awareness of the community and all, all those things have come up, which really is key. Then there's the other aspect which has to do with the kinds of investment that we are putting into. Yes. But beyond the investment is a question of how relevant the investments we make are to the community, if you like. So, i.e. we're looking at a needs-based approach to providing, you know, certain resources. In your estimation, do you think that we tend to do things based on the needs of a particular group of people or it's done to, you know, just, if you like, for the optics at a particular time to make things look good, to make things look <laughs> pretty, that, okay, this is what we're doing. Uh, let, let me know your opinion on that. <laughs> yes, Abna, you have a pretty good description of mm. the question you are asking yourself. and. In my earlier submission, I talked about the plan. Mm -hmm. And you could attest that all the other panelists have not even cited any plan of sorts. Yes, yeah, we and don't uh, know where they are at the moment. If we ask now, they will tell you it's in a draft and will continue to be in the safe without even publishing it. So what is in it for us as Ghanaians? So the country's focus is health a priority. If it's a priority, then there should be, I mean, real investment for this kind of um, 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 priority that we set for ourselves. Curative and preventive health, as Samuel talked about. If we begin to focus on preventive health, there's no need building mansions for people to get sick and then go there. Mm -hmm. We have to be begin to educate or empower communities. Let the people know what is there as health, what they can do for themselves. Health is about the individual. So it doesn't take anybody to provide assistance, sort of, before the individual can provide um, support for him or herself. So let's empower them to know that in this condition, this is what you're supposed to do, rather than providing a lot of um, infrastructures and material things that people might need some support to be, to, before they are evacuated to such a facility. If I know I'm diabetic, I should know at every point what I'm supposed to do for myself. Let's get the facilities closer to the people, mm -hmm. to the people rather than always looking at strategies to move them mm -hmm. to the facility, mm -hmm. which of course a million, a 30 million uh, population can never fit into the same facility, mm -hmm. no matter how we term it. Right. But the same people could be in their homes 
could be in their offices, could be in wherever they find themselves, in their workplaces, and then assess health for themselves because right. it is their business. Right, and also, uh, as, as I think Doc and Prof mentioned that, the first responders and how, what to do. You, obviously, NGOs, you coming from the Coalition of NGOs in Health, sure. And um, Sam, Sam earlier on indicated that collaborative, you know, relationship that should exist between uh, NGOs and, you know, the state, as, as it were. Question is, as, as a coalition of, you know, NGOs in health, in terms of first responders situation and how we can empower people to, uh, to be able to, you know, deal with the situation before it escalates to a certain level. Is there anything you're doing to complement government's efforts, if at all? Of course. Coalition has um, co been collaborating with the um, Ghana Health Service, especially in almost other districts in Ghana. What do we do? We take up the community education, the advocacies, and then empowerment of community. Now, people even run to talk to coalition or NGOs within their, their various communities and then and the district just to assess some level of education, health um, education. And we provide the first response. In situations where uh, a pregnant woman is supposed to be rushed to the, uh, the hospital, the first person or the first group to rely on is the coalition members or the NGOs. In the no, no, that, that is fine, but I'm just asking, in terms of <laughs> citizens going about their normal duties, are they able to, by reason of maybe some training that they've received from the state or the NGOs, are they able to deliver? Is it a CPR when yeah. it's necessary? Is it if it's a woman who is about to deliver, they know some first aid, yeah. for lack yes. of a better word, maybe to deliver, that, to, 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 to yes. um, administer to a, 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 a person Those suffering from some ailment in one form or the other? That's what I'm asking. So it's not necessarily that they rush to you, exactly. Those are but the within basic, the community, they themselves are able to. Those are the basic education we provide them. Okay. So this is what we, we are talking about, collaboration. Mm -hmm. When you identify the key stakeholders, identify the private sector, identify the civil society NGOs, identify the practitioners. Now let these key people come together to reason about what goes to the community as a package or a knowledge for them to rely on. Now it is the business of the coalition or the NGOs or the civil society mm -hmm. through the churches, the faith-based organizations, lorry stations, taxi drivers, whatever, GPRT and so to provide this form of support to the, 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 the person that is sick. So we will provide them with the education. And it, it doesn't sit there. We have to constantly or consistently continue sure, to okay. make them mm. so that at least they have this basic knowledge mm. to be able to rely on in other than ra rushing to the um, um, facility. Exactly. The and, and before they get you know the, the patient to the healthcare facility, that's essential. But you see, in my preparation for this, I was trying to understand this whole yeah. system that we have, whether indeed there's a plan. I asked that question because I was looking for a plan. I didn't. But thankfully, I came across an article that has been put together by um, a, a number of you know, health, um, I believe, professionals here. It's, it says it's a special article. It's Hospital All Risk Emergency Preparedness in Ghana. So yeah. basically assessing that. Well, Quite some of the people. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Prof. There you <laughs> are. <laughs> yes. And so I, I looked at it and a number of interesting things coming out. You see, I think we've touched on some already. But there's this one here in terms of results. Uh, two results emerging from this. One is that... Uh, many of the nation's hospitals were not prepared for large road traffic accidents, yeah. resulting in surge demands and did not possess general emergency preparedness programs, which we've already alluded yeah. to here. The secondly, the hospital's respective abilities to handle large-scale road and traffic um, road traffic accidents were compromised by the lack of competent medical and allied health personnel and adequate supplies. Now, I want us to turn our attention to that situation because so, we, we have the situation of the infrastructure then the persons to manage. But of course, there's also the community level. So now, yeah. let's focus on what yeah. this finding is saying, Prof, that there's a certain lack of competent medical and allied health personnel and adequate supplies. Let's speak to that for a while. Yeah. Um, sadly, this is the truth. <laughs> Today, if you have the health workers, and we have several categories of health workers, uh, the lab people, the... Um, nurses, 
the pharmacist name it. We have got to a stage where each of these people should not graduate from a health, uh, 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 what, um, a school yeah. that provides health without having passed the basic life support okay. course. So that when they, somebody collapses, yeah. they should be able to, to resuscitate. Sure. Today, it's not the same. If we go around now and we meet 10 nurses on the street mm -hmm. and we feign that we've collapsed. They just leave us. The, you're dead. Maybe they will shout and ask for help and so on. Then, if you take the medical doctors, nobody should be registered without the advanced life support training. Mm -hmm. Simple. You know? So, we, we, as if we had a plan and we had our needs put together, then these are the things we need to train our people to be able to provide the support. So, when we looked at the, the development of uh, Accra, <coughs> for example. Do you know why 37 is based where it is? Tell us. It's because of the airport. Right, okay. If there was a, I mean, the airport major. was a major accident, the people could go straight to the hospital, you see. Uh, a work was also built to take the people who would get out of the plane or the accident. So there's some kind of planning, planning that is that. allowed. And so you need to look at those resources and you need to put people there who will deal with this situation. They may not be permanent, but if there was a coordination, people will be found from the woodworks who will come. Once they hear that there's an emergency, they, they route to that place. There is a coordination between the, the major facility that is receiving people and its link with the other facilities. Mm -hmm. Saying that, okay, Kolebu, get prepared. We are sending you uh, 20 people. Yeah. The, uh, reach, get prepared. Yeah. But there must be some level of coordination. Right. I mean, the, it all comes yeah. back to that the way yeah. coordination yeah. is. So, it, if you train them, coordination also means they are trained together. Right. Yeah. It's not just everybody is going to be trained and is put in the, in the. No. The coordination also means that these people are trained together from time to time. Mm -hmm. They do the operations because emergencies is the preparedness, how prepared you are. Because when the emergency arrives, the time you have is so small that if you're not prepared, <coughs> that's I mean, the end. That's you, the end. You, you just it's go. the preparedness. So right. we have to prepare, we have to go through the motions, and when it happens, then we'll be successful. Right. Dr. Bayo, yes. I want you to also speak to this issue about the, com the lack of competent Compet medical yes. and allied health yeah. you know, personnel. And, and I'm just wondering why as, a, as the association, Ghana Medical Association, what is it that you do to ensure that the basic standards are, are met? I mean, people, okay. if you're not meeting the necessary requirements, why should you be out there practicing? Okay, so I will not speak um, directly to the article mm -hmm. because it's a piece of scientific work. Right. And I know what they found is based on evidence. I would say that uh, if you take the generality, if you take, for instance, doctors, like Prof mentioned, every doctor basically knows basic life support system. Besides that, we are supposed to know the advanced life support system. And I think that if you challenge every doctor, they should be able to do that. Um, whether this, what he was talking about is it being certified and you being mm -hmm. trained mm -hmm. and requiring it for registration and stuff. For instance, we know that when doctors go into specialization, it's a requirement at some point in the course of your specialization to have certification in this. Right. Yes, so if we are making it a policy for people to produce or get an annual certificate for something like that, it's something that will be welcome. Just to make because sure that- Because for lawyers, I yeah, know we, for, we consist every year you need to- Yes, we also go through continuous professional right. development. Sure. Every year you must meet a minimum number of um, credit points. That shows that you have attended, you have renewed your knowledge, mm. and these things are done. Emergency is taught. Uh, ethics is taught and other issues are taught. So a national pro uh, program for certification on emergency system, mm. advanced life support, is something that will be welcome. So it's mandatory for everybody to go through it every now and then. And I think that is good. But I, I dare say that if you catch any doctor licensed in Ghana today practicing in an emergency, he can be up to the tax. But when they talk about the lack, it's not that just the skills are not there. It's also that the people with the skill are lacking. So when you look at our emergency system, we have a health system that is not equitable. And so if, if you perhaps collapse today uh, at TV3's premises, 
your chance of survival is never the same if you collapse at the car park at Cardio in Kolebu, in front of the Cardio Thoracic Unit. Yes. It will never be the same if you collapse in the district at Lambuse, in the Upper West region. Your chance of survival is not the same. And this is where the uh, discrepancies come in, and that's what we should be looking at, evening out. So I see the, the, the lack, as in the physical personnel who have been trained, are, are, they, not are not there, mm. are not available. Mm. And they were talking about mass catastrophes. Right. The Medical Association actually did a public lecture on it. We brought experts together to look at our emergency preparedness as a nation. Mm. And we also came up with similar findings, that if you have large disasters, like, uh, uh, let's say there's flooding or fire outbreak and several people are injured, what is the capacity of our hospitals to handle this? The basic thing is, do we have a system where we can recruit, call people urgently to attend to these emergencies? How do we do the distribution? Who becomes the incident manager? Who determines who goes where? You are going to have an ambulance scoop people, carry them to this place, the place is full, and then let's go to another place. Why must Even it be that? How you, you, you convey yeah. the people and into, into the, the ambulance? One thing. So it, it is, um, once we're discussing the ambulances, we will come yeah, there. We'll definitely because our ambulance there. system now is more of a scoop and run. You go scoop the person, and sometimes the process of transportation, you may even cause more harm than good. You, you understand? So in terms of that personnel lack, I see it in terms of the quantity of the people, their distribution, and refresher courses to make sure that their skills are sharp at all the time. And this calls for regular simulation exercises. It's not just about you having the knowledge. If you don't have practice, then your first emergency is going to be the practice. And that time is life under those circumstances. So regular simulation exercises are important. And I, I felt sad when Prof talked about the fact that if you found maybe 10 nurses and mm. you ask them to do support mm. uh, uh, CPR, maybe they may not be able to. I really hope that may not be the case. But <laughs> if that is the case, <laughs> then we have a bigger we're, problem. We're in an emergency. Yes, we are in an emergency. <laughs> because, you see, I was complaining about the ordinary person on the street yeah. not knowing how to respond. Oh, so yeah. if the trained people do also do not know how to respond, and then mm -hmm. it's more catastrophic. Now, some have called for the introduction of that, you know, the first responders yeah. um, training yeah. to be part of our... Our basic, basic curricula. Yes. It should be. And why it should be it, part of our... Why is it not? Because that is, I, I know for as long as I can remember, it has always been the call. Yes. Let's get that as part of the basic... And it is because basic. of the lack of coordination. Mm -hmm. Health is a cross-cutting sector. It should coordinate with education. Ministry of Health should talk with Ministry of Education. They should talk with Ministry of Road and Transport. For instance, how can somebody get a driver's license if the person do not know basic how to resource that accident scene? Right. Why can't we integrate at that level? How can somebody drive a metro mass bus if the person owned by the state, in a way, if the person cannot know how to handle people at an emergency scene? It should be tied to all. It should be tied to all yeah, this. Right. Yes. I'm saying to the entertainment industry, mm. if a movie that is pre-screened, and check if somebody collapses in that movie and all people do is scream and shout and jump around. That movie should not air. This is a point where we would zoom into the discussion on the ambulances which have been parked at the um, State House for some time now. A lot of pressure has come on government to get this, um, these ambulances distributed. Indeed, we've had several responses coming from the quarters of government, several explanations as to why they've been parked there for so long. I have, I believe, a timeline here indicating um, what has been said by which office, official of government. I'll be running us through that. But before that, let's take a listen to the president when he addressed um, uh, members of the media and that question about when the, the ambulances will be distributed was put to him. Let's listen to him and get back to the panel. The ambulances. The Minister for Special Development Initiatives who's been responsible for bringing them told me about a month, six weeks ago, that some of the ambulances were in, should she distribute it? And I said, no, she shouldn't. She should wait till they all come in. So one day we can distribute them all at the same time to all 275 constituencies. I saw myself getting into a tremendous amount of issues if you started distributing some and others didn't get it. Fortunately for us, all of them will be in by the end of this month. 160 odd are already in 
and the balance on the high seas will be here by the end of the month. The 300 will be there. On the 6th of January, I will commission them, and then the distribution will take place simultaneously across the country. And nobody's going to accuse me of favoritism, regionalism, this and that. So that's the president um, addressing uh, members of the media there. And he said, on the 6th of January, I will commission them and have them distributed. But obviously, the 6th of January came and that didn't happen because we are told that the National Ambulance Service, um, the CEO of the National Ambulance Service, wrote to the president requesting that that be temporarily halted owing to a number of reasons, among them being the fact that certain preparatory activities that ought to have been done prior to the distribution were behind schedule. Um, at some point very soon in the program, we will be speaking on phone to the CEO of um, the National Ambulance Service, Dr. Zakaria. We are, we are happy to speak to him there. But now, right, let me start from you. A number of um, explanations as to why the ambulances had to be parked there came. Let me see. November 15th, we heard from the health minister, Mr. Kwekwajiman Menu. He says, Ghanaians should exercise a little patience. We are still receiving them in batches, so we may have to hesitate a little in the distribution, but in case of any emergency, we will be able to deploy to save the situation. Then we had the Special Development Initiative Ministry, PRO, um, Kabori Awudumoro also saying this on, the, on November 15, 2019, that we are putting in place the structures that would ensure the ambulances are properly managed. And as I speak to you now, the processes are ongoing and there are plans on the ground that we have put in place. The distribution can be possible only after we have put everything in place and that will be in January 2020. Then the Minister for Special Development Initiatives, Mavis Howard Kumsen also says, the deaths of Ghanaians was a worrying situation, hence the decision by the president to procure these ambulances, especially for remote areas. We, i.e. the NPP, acquired the ambulances <coughs> to serve the people and will not shirk that responsibility. This is November 19, 2019. And the president on the um, 15th of December 2019 indicated that he was going to get it, them commissioned and distributed. So. A number of <coughs> explanations coming in. Still, we have the ambulances parked there causing a whole lot of ruckus amongst the Ghanaian populace. Right. <laughs> what do you make of all of this? <laughs> yeah. Avna, um, I'm very disappointed when it comes to discussion on the ambulance, mm -hmm. especially with the statement made by the president himself concerning favoritism, insisting on the arrival of all the ambulances, and then putting all of them in place before commissioning and distribution. We are talking about how many lives might have been lost mm -hmm. in all those delays. Over four months, ambulances packed. Let us pull out the, the statistics from the health service dims. And know how many people, pregnant women, how many accident cases happened within that period that needed an emergency um, um, evacuation through these ambulances. So favoritism, people should die out of that. You know, it's, it's, it's not a palatable situation at all. And then what baffles me most is all the excuses that are put in the letter. Tracking systems, <coughs> training of personnel. Immediately the president speaks. Somebody should take action. And the action should come from the aligned service or authority. He says, I am going to provide one ambulance, one constituency. Immediately, somebody should follow up to the president's um, um, office. How are we going to do this? When is it arriving? What is the plan? Put the plan together and show it. Don't come and tell me you are, you are waiting for the ambulance to arrive before you start training. And now you need three weeks after four months to train people, set up service centers, put tracking systems there. It is unacceptable. I mean, we just cannot accept all these mm. excuses whilst people are dying day after day and then ambulances are packed. Right. Now, we are told that it would be commissioned on the 28th of January. It should so. be commissioned even tomorrow. I know, right. Samuel, <laughs> clearly issues about coordination written all over this issue here, or lack of coordination. Even the fact that the president announced 
on the 15th of December that it was going to be. He was going to commission and distribute on the 6th only for the National Ambulance Service to come a day before that event with this. Suggest that clearly when the president was making that statement, obviously, I mean, that statement was made without the necessary background to how the ambulance, National Ambulance Service, was looking at receiving these ambulances. Clearly another disconnect in there, showing another lack of coordination even at that level. Yes, I, I, I mean, for me, I, I guess I have, I have described this situation as a, it's like a masquerade festival. So many colors and uh, almost of the same color. And you cannot tell who actually is in charge here. But you see, the president's office is a very high office. And for such an issue, that brought all the brouhaha. Before the president would make a statement like that, he should have been mm -hmm. adequately briefed. Now, if he was not briefed, now I know he has some information to tell us that, listen, on the 6th, we'll get this done. The bit about his reason of, of waiting for all the 300, of course, that, that is his prerogative. I don't want to, to fault him. But I am particularly also surprised the president is, is, is scared of criticism. I know, right? Now, for me, criticism, which will inure to the benefit of the people, he should be prepared to take it. Now, if these ambulances are deployed to some three, four places before others get it and it is saving lives, let people call them, let them allude to favoritism. So for me, the president has to be bold and be prepared to receive some of these flack when it comes, particularly if his action will, will go to the benefit of the ordinary person now. There's a disconnect here, and that's where I think some public officers need to be very responsible. We are getting to the point where uh, people, for example, there's a minister that the president alludes is in charge of this. Now, what has been the preparations over the period? So the sense of urgency actually is lost out in this issue. Some officers along the lane may have not actually briefed the president well. And I think the president probably should be picking up his wig to mm. do some flagging. Mm. But now, my point is about the disconnect even with the intention. 275 ambulances. It's actually 200, 200 and and something. So, so 275 constituencies. When did we begin to talk about constituencies with regards to our healthcare delivery? The healthcare system is run through the district. The, 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 there's a district health management teams managing at the, at the lower level at that end. Mm -hmm. So if it's for the constituency, I'm beginning to look at, then who then will be, will, will be controlling, who will be supervising the activities mm -hmm. of this? Let's be careful. Once constituencies are mentioned, then it begins to take a political color. Right. And we need to be careful. If we are not careful, such a noble investment or idea to get to improve our emergency response system may be tagged as an MPP, uh, something that has <coughs> come from the cloud. This is not new. Mm. So let's just get into the system which already is, which is the Ghana Health System, which is the implementing arm of the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. And they are the people that are supposed to run this. Mm -hmm. Let's take away the politics of it so the people that need this can get benefit. But to wait to say we are fixing service centers. We have a National <coughs> Ambulance Service that already has service centers. Right. Thank or if you. we don't have service centers, someone should be <coughs> telling us. Very well. Prof, what do you make of the situation? That for several, a couple of months, you know, they had been packed, the ambulance had been packed, their pressure comes on government, let's get these distributed to the, se to the places where it is needed and where it would, you know, um, 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 be put to, to use. Then we have the president addressing, you know, the media, and he indicates that we will have it commissioned and distributed on the 6th. So, yes, we're all looking forward to that day. Then we have this letter coming in from the National Ambulance Service saying that, well, put it on hold because a number of preparatory activities are behind schedule. Again, the issue about coordination, planning, because you would, I mean, I would want to believe that before you procure these things, you would put in place a certain plan. That yes, it will come on a certain date, by which date we would have done all sorts of things, A, B, C, and D, and then we could actually have them dispatched onto the field to serve the purpose for which they were procured. Here we are, ambulances in, partially, some not in, yet to come, training behind schedule, and a whole lot of things, and we still have the ambulances back there. Yeah, I mean, thanks very much. Um, 
this whole <laughs> issue about the ambulances for me has are taking a turn where uh, we're portraying this as if there's only one way to deal with a problem that right. we have. And I will start by giving my own advice to the president as if I were his advisor. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with the ambulances being in, in place, going to the constituencies. The first 50 should go to where they're supposed to go, they are labeled, whatever it is. And when they're all ready, you can still commission it. So they could have been working. And one day they all come back to the front of the place. Mm. If that is the purpose, is to demonstrate that we have 275 ambulances. Some could have been in, uh, in operation for four months, but they will arrive at the day to be commissioned. That is if we even need to commission well, them at all. If you need to commission <coughs> it. So the commissioning should not stand in the way mm. of the use of the ambulances. Number two, I have a problem with this national things that are done with something that has not been tested. Like um, my colleague said, you are now going to the constituency level. We don't have a system that looks at ambulances running at the constituency level. So my thinking would have been that you will try it, whatever you are planning to do. I don't know what On the pilot basis. To, they, you will try it on the pilot. 50 are here. Give it to those 50 constituencies. Set up your system and see whether it's working. Okay? Because the question is, after 28th January, what's going to happen? All the partners that are sitting around, I'm not sure they all know what the plans are. You know? Because the system before now is, I mean, they said they have about 100 uh, sites or something, if you read. So they yeah. haven't got a system that is looking at 275. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how is this going to fit in? So by accident, you have had a chance that the ambulances are coming in bits. Why not plug them in, look at your system, tighten the loose ends so that the others will come in seamlessly mm. and something will start going. So, and we can still uh, fulfill the promise of commissioning for the political people by bringing the ambulances back. <laughs> and and the, the television cameras will... <laughs> We'll show you. Right. right. I, mean, for, 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 I like I like Prof's use of the phrase for the political people. <laughs> I mean, yes, to meet that end. To I mean, really, that that if that's what you want, yeah. then if that's what bring want, them back. We can still solve the problem. Right. Commission it. Why are we are <coughs> stopping all this discussion? Sure. Because the, what we are doing now is making people more irritated sure. about the, the commission. Still packed. Exactly. You see? Yeah. But if we are started using them and we commission, mm. people will say, okay, mm. it's not. Right. Right. Sure. Doc, yeah. clearly uh, another, another, another situation where we're looking at lack of planning, um, uh, preparedness for, you know, uh, a laudable initiative, if yeah. you ask me, but it, it's, it's been dealt with in a, in, 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 a, in a manner where, you know, more than likely you would say that, well, you did something good or you intended something good, but it's turning out to be a certain, you know, situation altogether. Yeah, uh, it's a very sad one, a very, very sad one. And I think that for us practitioners, we would view this ambulance issue from about three perspectives. That gives how we understand it. As people who are going to work in the system that uses this, as advocates for our patients, and as potential patients who could be using these ambulance services. And the uh, Prof's first submission, we talks about the nature of organization of our healthcare system and the inequities in there tells us that whoever planned this thing perhaps didn't understand the system. <coughs> because if you say you want to distribute all to all constituencies at the same time, first there's a problem, and I think that has been mentioned because the constituency system is not recognized mm -hmm. by our health service. Mm -hmm. But besides that, the needs are not the same. Mm. In Accra here, there are some ambulances running. There are private ambulances running. Private facilities have their own ambulances. So the ability of somebody to get access to an ambulance in Accra is not the same as somebody to get ambulance in my village. And so if you say that the people from my village should wait whilst the one from Accra will be ready before we distribute, how does that explanation go down to anybody? I just can't understand it. So it, it just doesn't add up that you would want to wait to get everything before you distribute. 
and <coughs> they are, you are distributing them into what system? Mm. And as advocates for the people, so after this grand commissioning, we see the ambulances drive around. Are they just flyers at, at seven as educate? Uh, I don't know whether for, I, I don't know what to use, whether for publicity purposes that they are labeled, okay, so the people in the village walk around and see, okay, we have an ambulance labeled, or France Rebu constituency, or Lambusier constituency, yeah. okay, so we have our own ambulance. Is that the purpose it is to serve? If not, after that day of commissioning, what happens? Mm -hmm. So I am a practitioner. I have no clue what is going to happen after the grand commissioning. Right. So my colleague who is a doctor in a village somewhere does not know. So after this day, what is new? At this, I know the National Ambulance Service have a system. But how is this integrated into their system? Right. And if it was going to go into their system, really, did we have to wait mm. to get everything? Mm. Because their system already exists. Mm -hmm. You have some numbers that are broken down. Mm -hmm. You have a few still running. Mm -hmm. At some point, 57 were running. At some point, 90 something. So you are just adding up. Why don't you continue adding up? You can do the commissioning with the few that comes last minute. Right. And then we know that you've had this number. Why? In fact, I would not even agree to driving an ambulance from Lambusi for 12 hours to come to Accra for another commissioning. Right. It's a, I, I mean, would Prof. Not, was saying that to say that uh, yes, to satisfy all, the people. To do. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Well, let's do that. I can't understand that. <laughs> but I, the whole, we take this commissioning out of proportion. <laughs> right. We've done it in educational facilities, but for emergency, you see a school built and people are still under trees, waiting for six months for someone to come and commission before mm. they'll go in. Mm. But that should not happen to an ambulance. Right. I, let me just check whether we have um, the CEO of the National Ambulance Service on the line with us. Do we have him on the line, um, Dr. Zakaria? Um, okay, so we will take, let's take a listen to some other aspects of this conversation and uh, we'll return shortly to have that conversation with Dr. Zakaria. For the first time in the history of the country, and for, the, for that matter, the service, the government has generously also agreed to do insurance for all these vehicles. And this is something that has never happened. And that insurance itself is a whole process on its own. The other innovation is installation of the tracking devices to improve efficiency, and then eventually um, release of the vehicles. Now, the truth of the matter is that once the, the president made pronouncement as regards the commissioning on the 6th of January, it would definitely reactivate the process of everybody expediting action. But obviously, there are some of the processes that you could have internal control over. Others, obviously, are external beyond the, um, the authorities in the country. So, for example, you needed to go through procurement process and get a contractor to do the tracking device. Equally, you needed to do that to get someone who would do the insurance of the vehicles. You understand? Yes. And the other one, it is obviously the training. And the training, we are talking about two different types of training here. Sometimes people tend to think it's the training we do. In terms of service delivery and pre-hospital emergency care services, that is the training we do at the paramedic and emergency care training school. That has been done. And that's why we had about 450. So let's clarify. Your staff, who are supposed to be the paramedics who will uh, use these ambulances, have the requisite national standard training. What you are saying they need is Absolutely. specific to the Absolutely. ambulances so that are specific. coming in. And you know, as part of the contract, normally, for purposes of the warranty, the manufacturer will want to ensure that he gets a qualified person to come and train whoever is going to use the vehicles and the equipment so that they are sure that at least as a start, the training has been, done, has been done on their part. And you cannot violate that clause because if you do, it means that you are losing the warranty. And because of the quantum of vehicles you're buying, obviously you cannot afford to ignore the warranty. And it is that component of training we are talking about. And normally the manufacturers have their own timelines. All efforts to get them can arrive before the stipulated time that they had planned failed because they really, with all good um, intention, wanted to go by that. But unfortunately, it did not happen. And therefore, they have given us the date of the 13th. So putting all these things together, we realized that by today, which is the 6th of January, a date for the commissioning, many of these processes were still ongoing and therefore there was no need to commission and still leave their vehicles and they cannot be operationalized. And mind you, the objective of the president is not just to commission for the sake of it, but to make sure that he gets a vehicle in good state, deliver them and the people can start benefiting. And so it is in the interest of everybody 
that that small delay is accepted so that the processes are completed and when the vehicles are released, they obviously will start... But that small delay is two weeks. Are you certain that two weeks is enough to address all the myriad of issues you've raised in, in that letter to the health ministry subsequently to the president? Absolutely. If you go to the forecourt of the parliament house now, you'll see a lot of these activities ongoing. The one that is pending the arrival of the manufacturers is the one that they will arrive on the 12th of January and then do the training on the 13th of January. So obviously, and then the last batch of the 307, 48 are arriving today and the last 48 will arrive on the 18th of January. Okay, so that was the CEO of the National Ambulance Service, Dr. Ahmed Zakaria speaking to um, Stephen Ante in there, so that was it. Um, we're not going to have him on the line. It was that interview we're going to play, and so that's him, or that was him there, and sh trying to explain, you know, some areas that are a bit murky in respect of this matter. Now he says that 48 more ambulances had arrived as of the time he was speaking to Stephen. That was on the 6th of January, uh, 2020, and that the remaining 48 would arrive on the 18th of. January 2020. That would be 10 days to the Grand Commissioning. We hope that by then everything would have been fixed <laughs> in, in, in those that would come late. The 48 that come late, whether 10 <laughs> or 9 days would be sufficient time to address that is an issue. But let's see. I, I mean, I went onto the National Ambulance Services website just to, you know, understand. And I, there I found that they currently have 133 stations. Yes with 10 regional control rooms across the country. And I believe that's where we're, we've been going yeah. with this thing about where would they, f I mean, how would they be plugged in, yes. these 275, you know, how would they be plugged in? Because obviously from the website, it is the National Ambulance Service that would receive yeah. these, these ambulances mm -hmm. and then do all of that. So 133 stations with 10 regional control rooms across the country receiving 275 probably even more because there are 307 ambulances that have been shipped in yeah. and um, trying to see how you know that could be uh, right I will come back to you on that in respect of the training still on the National Ambulance Service um, websites I came across an article that was titled boldly National Ambulance Service NAS ready for new ambulance as staff learn new skills and this is dated 26 September 2019 so I'm just trying to understand how this bit about training mm. comes in. When, as of September 26, 2019, the, the National Ambulance Service had actually indicated that they were ready for the ambulances to come because their, their, their staff had received new skills. So, uh, I mean, what do you make of that? I'm trying to make sense out of, you know, the situation, though. So, I mean, uh, the discussion continues to be very confusing mm. around the table when you project new things that are happening. 133 stations, but the <coughs> CEO continues to state that they are supposed to create service centers. Don't we have service centers within the stations? The 133, existing mm -hmm. 133. Now, there has been some training in September, way back in September, but we are still um, waiting for others to be trained before the, the commissioning on the 28th. Still awaiting arrival of about 96 more ambulances. And so if you look at all these things, um, that's where I tend to agree with my brother Samuel that was the president rightly informed. Were they ready? Were the ambulance um, um, service ready? Did they have any plan for the statement that the president made? What has been the consistency in those planning? And then what has been the coordination between them and the other ministries and yeah. the president's office? So you, I'm only hoping that 28 comes and they don't give us another excuse. Yeah. Because our concern, yeah. our major concern here, is the lives of the people. Right. And further, it's about the areas or the districts that need the ambulance. The ambulances should be discharged and given to them for, for use. Mm -hmm. Commissioning, president can, can still use one or two, commission one or two. Ah, in that sense, not to, to line up all 307 ambulances in that flamboyant 
um, um, kind of um, style <coughs> for the whole world to know, yes, I promise ambulances and they are here. I think we've gone way beyond that. Mm -hmm. And then we should begin to do things in a moderate and rather save the purposes right. of the people. Right. We need to wrap up on this conversation. So, Samuel, let me have your uh, thoughts on this as we, as we conclude. You yeah, know. My, my, my concluding thoughts are the, the more we delay, uh, the more we put the lives of our own people at risk. Already their lives are at risk and we have opportunity to redeem them out of it and it looks like we are just allowing time to go away. We need to, we need to get to work quickly on that. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I also feel the bit about the fanfare and it comes at quite some cost. Mm -hmm. I am looking at all these 300 ambulances in quite some flamboyant uh, <coughs> this commissioning, the bit of commissioning we need to look at and the costs that are associated with them. We saw over, like we were told, 100,000 100, young people have been employed and they, they were to be enrolled under NAPCO and to, to, to commission that, that we had over thousands of young people paraded in the sun in t-shirts for us to know these are NAPCO people. I'm not saying this because I have issues with NAPCO, but the situation where we want to parade and show that, that pomp, that pageantry which is supposed to come with it, if we can do away with it and look at the core and the real business, why those, those, those projects are undertaken, mm. it, it will do us some good. But I feel the reasons we, that have come, we'll take them for now, but then let's not go beyond 28 January. That would be a disaster for the president and all his appointees. Yeah, right. I mean, um, Doc, you yeah. mentioned earlier that, yes, yeah, so after the 28th, <coughs> if indeed we do have the commission on the 28th, what happens? What, what has changed? Yeah. What, so, you know, uh, I, and, and wrap up for me. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that it's a, a sad spectacle, but uh, we have to make do with what we have. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think the, the, the feeling we speak with is if you are a doctor somewhere, you have a patient, you've done to your possible best, mm -hmm. the person needs to get another facility. And you just don't have a means of getting that patient to move. The whole period you are traumatized. You may watch somebody virtually dying before you, but you've reached the limit of your capacity. The second thing is you are the receiving center. You receive a patient <coughs> in a taxi, unaccompanied by any health personnel, managed wrongly in transit. You get traumatized. You don't even know where to begin from. There's no continuity of care. So these ambulances will play a critical role to solve some of these problems. I am worried about the education, education to the public, education to the users, potential users, and not ambulance service workers, the health service itself. Mm. People have the perception, okay, this is one ambulance for my constituency, so it should be seen in my constituency. Are these service centers aligned to the constituencies? How are people going to view it? So if the, it happens that there's one service center in a particular region and they are all supposed to be packed there or in a district, how do people, how are people educated to understand this? Yeah. So in my wrap up, I would say that I think that an emergency, emergency medical services is one thing that does not discriminate. It affects all of us equally. And so when it comes to that, it is our call that we put politics aside, mm -hmm. put racial differences, regional differences, ethnic, nothing, and <coughs> see it as something we have to fix the system right. for all of us. Right. Whether you are uh, an immigrant living here or you are Ghanaian, if you have an emergency, it is that system that takes care of you. Mm -hmm. And we are rated internationally based on our emergency preparedness. Where do we rank, by the way, on that? <laughs> I, just want to I think you should watch, <laughs> read, read, read the site's Where? travel advice <coughs> from the UK government, yeah. travel advice from mm -hmm. the uh, American mm -hmm. government on people coming here mm -hmm. in terms of emergency. Sure. And it's very sad. Very well. You know, because the, the, our state of preparedness is not, not something to write home about. So I think that we should fix the system. We should integrate this system. But the ambulance is not the only panacea. Sure. We must have a aspect. proper bed bureau management system sure. backed by IT that every doctor, every nurse can just tap an app and know that at this hospital within my region, I can get a space. Sure. So when I call the ambulance, it's going there. Sure. If not, what's going to happen is I will have this ambulance come with patients mm -hmm. and queue in the hospital because they cannot even discharge the patients. Exactly. Or they drop the patient and they leave their stretcher so the ambulance can no longer function. Sure. So yeah. these are some of the real right. issues we have to deal with. Very well. So that interrelated aspects of it we need to look at. Exactly. Ambulances integral, but not the, panacea. the 
Yes, yeah. dependency. Yeah. Prof, you wrap up. Uh, yeah, so I, for me. well, I, I'll, I just uh, just want to add a little bit to what my colleagues have said. They've said most of it. Mm -hmm. I think the the CEO should be focusing on the system itself because the ambulance is not, it's just to carry people from one place to the to next. The other, right. And what saddens me is that when these people are carried to the next point, like you said, there's nobody to receive them. That's not an ambulance ser mm. service. We've seen it in movies. If the ambulance leaves, it, it's, by the time it sees the patient, it's communicating with the receiving people, it's getting information back, and starting to treat the patient. Mm. So by the time he arrives at the center, Somebody is there to, to continue see. with the, the, the plan. Okay. And I think you should concentrate on that. Right. Secondly, I also think that we need to have a, the plan. In fact, some of us do not accept the National Ambulance Service because they are, the needs are different for different parts of this country. And we cannot have one wholesale thing that is put there. If we do this in a sub-regional way, that's how we bring the communities into this whole play. They will determine what re the requirements are. Let's not forget that the ambulance services also must look at the issue of volunteers. <coughs> How many people are you going to train? 500? 1,000? You only serve the urban population and forget about those who are actually in need. So there's a need for the volunteer system and this whole thing must be revisited. Currently, I understand our emergency system is led by NADMO. <laughs> Please, let's have a conversation <laughs> and really do something about the emergency system. Thank you. On, on, on that note, we bring a conversation on, you know, our healthcare um, emergency management response system to a close. But let me say a big, big thank you to my panelists. They've done a wonderful job. From my left, we've had Samuel Arthur. He's an, a, um, a health analyst. We've also had Bright Emisanyako. He's a national vice chair coalition of NGOs in health. Um, Professor Fred Binker, he's a former Vice Chancellor of the University of Health and Allied Sciences. And lastly, we've had Dr. Titus Bayou. He is the Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. Stick with us. We'll be back to look at the voter registration uh, debacle that currently has engulfed the nation. We're now going to turn our attention to the debate over um, the EC's plans to compile a new voters register. Um, this, we had a number of developments in the week, um, several a coalition or a couple of coalitions of political parties stating their positions on the issue. Uh, a six member coalition of political parties calling itself the inter-party resistance against the new voters register. Uh, may, had a press conference and indicated their position on that. And then there was the other um, press conference organized by some 13 other political parties, including the ruling national, I'm um, sorry, New Patriotic Party, also stating their position for the EC's um, position to, or decision to compile a new voters register. So we'll take um, a look at these two press conferences, snippets of them, and then come to the studio for the panelists to give their perspective. But before then, let me quickly introduce uh, the panel that will be having this conversation. From my extreme left, we have Fred Amankwa Safo. He is um, a doctoral researcher uh, with the University of Ghana Business School Operations and Management Information Systems. And also he is a member of the national communications team of the NPP. Then we have Osei Kwame Griffiths. He's a director of IT with the National um, Democratic Congress, NDC. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Good welcome morning. to the Good show. Morning. Great. So as I indicated earlier, we'll have those two stories to listen to and then return to the panel. Let's take a listen to that. The forum was to take a critical look at the Electoral Commission's decision to procure a new biometric voters management system for the December elections. We have no option than to advocate for a no and do a no campaign and to bring this whole uh, decision by the EC to a halt like we did in the referendum. Speakers at the forum, which included managing editor of the Daily Insight, Kwesi Pat, said he will lead Guineans to reject the 2020 general election results if the Electoral Commission fails to listen to stakeholders. 
He argues that the constitution grants the EC autonomy, but not absolute autonomy. Common sense tells us that you cannot have a public institution which is independent of the people's whose sovereign authority it exercises. Because if you have a situation where you have a public institution exercising independent authority above the sovereignty of the people, then they are beginning to play God, and that is dangerous for any democratic enterprise. Indeed, the commissioners themselves should remind themselves of how they got into office because their predecessors were removed from office in spite of their independence. Chairman of the People's National Convention, Bernard Mona, wondered why a register that was used to elect some 6,000 assembly members in the district level elections and biometric verification devices that worked about 98.8% as put out by election observers is not fit for the election of 275 MPs and a president. There was no difficulty with the devices. So these are the things that the Electoral Commission has said. Kodeo has come to confirm that the machines worked perfectly. The Electoral Commission, again in the uh, District Assembly elections, claimed that the voters' register is very credible, to quote um, Sami Tete of the Electoral Commission. Now, the question I want to pose is that why is the Electoral Commission interested in changing something they themselves have described as very credible for something whose credibility we don't know. On the procurement of new biometric verification devices, which the Commission says will save the country some 9 million cities, financial analyst Dr. Jerry Monfant disagrees. Is that on the same conference that was organized, the EC said in that document that they had used 2 million cities to refurbish almost all the old ones that wouldn't have worked. And they just did it. They bought new parts to replace them. And they had tried with it. They had used it. And it has worked perfectly. And had achieved 99.4% of accuracy. So why would you need 50 million to go and buy new equipment at this particular moment? <laughs>
we will continue to monitor whichever vendor that gets the contract to deliver and make sure that they deliver to the, the satisfaction of us all. Well, so those were some uh, snippets from the press conferences organized by the coalition for uh, the compilation of the new voters register and the coalition against uh, the EC's decision to compile a new voters register. Indeed, the coalition against colonies of the inter-party resistance against the new voter register served notice that they would be <coughs> organizing a series of demonstrations they call Yempini demonstrations across the country and indeed the first of those de demonstrations is currently underway in Tamale. Uh, we'll link up with our northern regional correspondent Zubeida Ismail to give us an update on what's happening there. Good morning, hello. <coughs> yes, Zubeida, how are you? <coughs> I'm fine, thank Great, you. great. So just bring us up to speed. What's happening at that with the protests or demonstrations currently underway? And then, so um, we have um, members of the party resistance against the uh, new voter register uh, here in Tamale. And uh, as you speak, they are currently around uh, an area we call Kumbele in Tamale. So we prepared at the uh, Tamale Jubilee Park about an hour ago, and then uh, they started their march. And they are expected to walk through some major streets in Tamale. So um, from the Jubilee Park, they took the bank street to the border road and uh, then they clearly connected to the domain area. They are supposed to go through the Ali Muhammad Stock Stadium, pass through Johanne, come through the Picona Road and back to the conversion place that is the Jubilee Park. That is where they will be sending their message. And of course, even before they converge back and then send their message, we all know what the reason for the demonstration is as to resist um, the compilation of a new voters register. I must as well also say to you um, who, who and who have spoken um, this morning. I personally spoke to the NDC national chairman, that is uh, the John Popo. I've uh, also seen the um, NDC parliamentary candidates for Tamale, um, uh, North Sash, Allah, and Suhini. I've seen, um, so this is, uh, this is an Issa party, uh, organization. I've also seen the Nadmona of the PNC, the national chairman. I've seen the national communications director for NDC, Sami Jesse. Of course, he's supposed to be here because he is the mouthpiece of the NDC. And also, the deputy um, national secretary of um, NDC, Ochukono, is also here. I, I am told that yesterday there was a press conference, and uh, the information I've gathered is that eight political parties actually have, I mean, arrived in Tamale yesterday and they are part of today's uh, demonstration. I have not seen them personally. The names I've given you are those I have spotted. And then as um, they go around and then they get back to the convergence, I expect to get messages from these other political parties, that is the seven other political parties, including the those that are actually spearheading heading this demonstration here in the NDC. Right. Zubaida, if you could just tell us, give us an indication of the turnouts. How would you describe the turnouts? In term, you know, um, could you give an estimate of the numbers you're seeing? Uh, the numbers, I, I must tell you that um, I actually didn't expect what I have seen today. Um, I, we have huge numbers. And even when the team itself had left the Jubilee Park for about some minutes, um, while we, the media guys, were also trying to put ourselves together and then follow them. We also saw many people arriving at the Jubilee Park trying to find out where the team or where the demonstrators were so they could join. And I'll tell you that at least I, 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 can, I can count over a thousand people who are part of this demonstration today. This is a number that we didn't actually expect. And so it's actually an overwhelming number. And we expect that even before they return to the convergent place, there will be more people to add to the numbers. Very well. I think we can end it here. Thank you so much. We'll be touching base uh, from time to time, you know, um, in the course of the day, and we'll see how that pans out. But thank you so much, Zubeda Ismail. That's uh, our Northern Regional Correspondent who's give, who just gave us an, up, um, an update on events um, panning out at the Yempenit demonstration. In fact, that's the first of the series that was 
announced by the Inter-Party Resistance Against the New Voter Register um, Coalition, who indicated that they'll be carrying or undertaking a number of demonstrations around across the country. And they started off with the first in Tamale. And Zubeda is telling us that indeed the turnout has been impressive, she says. She estimates that about 1,000 people are currently, uh, you know, um, 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 on board. And she expects that the number would grow when they get back to the converging point. So we will be plugging in as and when we go along in, in the course of the, um, the day, the various programs on the network. But in the studio, we have, um, as indicated earlier, Mr. Fred Amankwa Safo. Uh, he's with the NPP and Ose Kwame Griffiths with the NDC. Great. So I'll start with you, Ose Kwame. <coughs> You just had an update there, obviously. I'm sure you're, you're, you're happy with the turnout that you, Zubeda is telling us about. Um, over 1,000, she indicates. <clears throat> yeah, just the early hours and having over 1,000 is quite impressive. Right, and, 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 and clearly you have some other demonstrations to, to, to embark upon from the press conference that you had. But um, let's go into the issues. So... The EC's decision to compile a new voters register, according to their reports, you know, several times published, is, is on the basis of uh, like two sources of advice, if, if I could put it. One, they indicate that the previous service provider, that's the STL, had made some proposals. And then, of course, from their own um, IT consultants and their IT staff, where a number of issues have been raised about, you know, the current system, which necessitates, in their opinion, the acquisition of a new, you know, biometric system, and of course, the compilation of a new voters register. Your party, indeed, the Interparty Resistance Against the New Voter Register, have have had cause to state your reservations, and of course, indicated your strong position against this decision. Something that perhaps uh, the EC has, you know, the backing of the law in terms of what is to do. It's a constitutionally mandated body, and it 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 works, you know, as it deems appropriate to carry out its functions. So, question then is, if the EC decides to carry on with this, what is it about that decision that really? makes you think that, no, this shouldn't be the case? Okay. Uh, first of all, let me begin by the EC's uh, uh, claim that they have a report from the previous vendor, mm -hmm. STL, and then their own IT staff. You know, these reports have advised them to embark on this exercise of right. uh, throwing away a system that has produced 17 million uh, records of uh, both biometric and demographic data of voters in this country. And then procuring a new system and then starting, you know, afresh to register everybody in this country. Uh, I'd like to first indicate that these conversations have gone on at IPAC, where I was present. Mm. and. Uh, I mean, three IPACs, but I'm going to touch on two. The first one was 25th of November, 2019, <coughs> mm -hmm. where the EC made the claim that uh, they had some technical issues that warranted the procurement of a new system and re-registration of all Ghanaians. When they said that, they touched on facial recognition as an addition that will be used to uh, verify some Ghanaians who are unable to be verified with a fingerprint modality. When they said that, uh, and then they talked about their wide area network and several other issues, and it was presented by the chairperson of the EC, uh, Madame Jane Mensah. At that meeting, the NDC team raised issues with, first of all, the fact that every time there's a talk about voters register, Madame J. Mensah seemed to sneak it on the agenda through an emergency 
IPAC meeting. And then two, the fact that all the issues that she had mentioned did not warrant the throwing away of the system and then the re-registration of all Ghanaians. We pointed out to her that even the facial recognition, which is a new <coughs> modality she is seeking to add, could be added to the old system. And we cited examples. We gave her you know, the, uh, the fact that the photos which are used for facial recognition were present in the current register, register in the database. And we also cited example of the new patriotic parties, uh, then vice presidential uh, <coughs> candidate, now the vice president of this country, mm -hmm. citing a, 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 an instance where they had used facial recognition to cross match the Ghana register and the Togolese register. And they claimed they had found 72,000 hits. So we gave all these examples. She then said that she, because she's not a technical person, she more or less alluded that now she's going to bring her technical team, you know, to come in and come in and uh, throw more light on why there's a need for a new voters register. The technical team, there was another emergency meeting, interestingly, another emergency meeting where the technical team with consultants from the EC, uh, uh, from Fairgreens, I believe, you know, came to give a more detailed technical issues on the matter. At that meeting, we, not, we didn't leave the meeting to write, prepare any document for them. We took issues after issues and gave them how they can solve those issues without throwing away the register and the system that has produced the register. They even but they're saying that the cost of what you're saying is your preferred option, which is perhaps let's, an up, let's upgrade the existing one is perhaps higher than the cost of acquiring a new one, or even if it's the same. Uh, so I'll, then what's the point in I, I will come dealing to that. with you know, I, the I, I old will, system when we can get a new one? I will, come, I will come to that. It was after we had dealt with the technical team and all the issues they, you know, they mentioned, that the EC then said that they are being advised <coughs> by some documents that exist, the one from the previous vendor and then another from some consultants. And also there's some costing that they have got that indicates that it is more expensive to, to uh, refurbish. <coughs> refurbish. That is their language. <laughs> that is the language they use. <laughs> to refurbish the, the old system. So all political parties at IPAC said that EC should make these reports available to all of us. After all, if we see these reports and it is true that it is <coughs> more costly to refurbish the old one as opposed to embarking on a new one, we will all understand and jump on board. As I speak to you now, the EC has not been able to produce these reports they claim they have and that supports what they are doing. Mm. But certain things are worth noting. In their own press statement, they indicated that they had refurbished their BVDs and BVRs at the cost of 2 million Ghana cities. You see, what they did, and that is the deceptive nature of this current EC uh, leadership, what they did not mention at the press conference is that the BVDs alone, they refurbished 59,000 of them. And then about 1,600 BVDs, which was used for the current, current exercise. Mm -hmm. You understand? So where is the claim that it is more expensive to refurbish the old ones as opposed to procuring the new one? Let us compare that to the cost that they are claiming here. They have put together as what they are going to buy the new ones. The new ones, they have here 80,000 BVDs at 199 million Ghana cities. Compare that to refurbishing 89,000 of them. And then BVRs, uh, 
174 million Ghana cities. Now, let us note that 1,600 BVRs and 59,000 BVDs were refurbished at 2 million Ghana cities. If you put these costs together, they are more than three, uh, 300 million uh, Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. So where lies the claim that it is more expensive to refurbish the old ones as opposed to, to uh, procuring a new one? So what they are saying is not true, cannot be true. We have a system that works well. It has so far been used in 2019 to elect 33,000 unit committee members, 7,000 assembly members, and it performed perfectly. So there is no reason why we should throw away such a system. And then the register that has been generated out of this system, you, you understand that. Another issue is, has to do with the, the, when I was watching the other 13, that is if they are actually 13 political parties. Why do you dispute that? Oh, because some of the memberships of, uh, you know, I think PNC was represented. But I you know PNC was also. Exactly. That raises another interesting issue. Uh, yes. You had the chairman so, with you. Yes, the chairman the with us. And vice then, with that is the why I'm of 13. Yes, that is why I'm saying that. Uh, I, I listened to them, mm -hmm. actually. And I have also listened to a few of the things they have said here. Now. They have indicated that, and the EC2 has stated that in their press conference, that there was a register done in election year in 2012, April and May, and then also 2004. Now, what they are forgetting is that the process of getting a new system and a register does not begin with the mass registration exercise. It begins with the procurement process. And in 2012, the procurement process started the first quarter of 2011 and concluded in 2011. So you're moving on into the timing issue yes. and the practicality of it within an election year. Yes. We'll come to that. But let me move to um, Fred for his uh, thoughts as well. Fred, obviously, you belong to the yes side <laughs> of, of the divide. You think there should be a new voters register. And let me just quickly say that I think, interestingly, the position of both parties have been consistent, looking at their agitations or the calls from, you know, way back. The NPP consistently has asked for a new voters register, even before the 2016 elections, which got the NPP elected into office. The NDC at the time was for the maintaining or the maintenance of that register. And post-2016, 2020, the positions are the same. So usually you would have had some, you know, changes which some people would have read opportunistic, you know, stands to it. But thankfully we don't have that. Currently there's that consistency. But question is, in view of all these that, you know, the coalition of the six, the inter-party, <laughs> um, what coalition against the new voters register or something like that are saying, you still maintain that we should have a new voters register, despite the cost elements they have talked about. Yeah, um, we still maintain that we should have a new voters register. And good morning to our viewers and my colleagues, your good self. I will want to take this in three points. The first is the system, the legal, and the politics. Now, we look at the system, and you realize that this current register was done in 2012 right and we had issues with it we thought it was bloated and so we went on demonstration serious on dem demonstration and today i'm glad that the ndc is going on demonstrations as well it's it's really enriches our democratic credentials i just pray that no casualty should be recorded <coughs> I'm, I'm not expecting that anybody should be shipped or bullets in somebody's eyes we want to, them to have a peaceful demonstration and I urge the police to protect them and protect them and, and persons and properties. Now, let's come to the system as we have. This system is biometric, but <coughs> it is not digital. It is not digital and it is not smart. Now, currently in 2012, the system in place then, and looking at it now, 
you might say it is working perfectly. It's helped us to do the um, um, district assembly elections. It helped us to go into 2016 elections, and we've won the elections in 2016. So, I mean, what, what's the big deal? Why are we asking all these things? <coughs> but for us in the NPP, it is not just our advantage that we, we seek. Mm. We seek to entrench democrats, democracy in this country. We did it in, 2000 and in 1992. You remember when we had the opaque ballot boxes? We went on. In fact, even before the opaque ballot boxes, the 1992 Electoral Commission arranged it such that we would have different dates for presidential and parliamentary. We thought that was wrong. My colleagues insisted. And even 20, 1992 elections, we went ahead with that arrangement. We boycotted the presidential, right? And then we parliamentary. We boycotted the parliamentary. And then we, 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 we came to the opaque ballot boxes. When we raised the issues, there were agitations. Our colleagues in the NDC refused it. Now, fast track, 2008, when we started asking for biometric um, um, uh, registration, our colleagues rejected it. Look, we went into that knowing that, look, the way technology is moving, we cannot continue to use the manual, physical, paper-based processes. We knew from 2008, we knew that we cannot continue on, on that tangent. So we pushed for, for it. We pushed for it, and then finally, there was, an, there was an agreement to go to do biometric verification. In fact, for me, I really thought that we could even be doing um, online um, 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 voting. We'll eventually get there, but let's yes. see so, for so, now. So this, this, is, this is the process. We'll eventually get there. To, to Why do we have to even go and queue? Why should that be the case? Now, we believe that the system that is in place now, looking at current um, um, arrangements worldwide, it is not fit for, for, for purpose. It is not efficient. It might be working perfectly. And my colleague is in the IT, and I respect him for that. But you see, systems don't need to, be, to have problems to change. You don't have to have problems with the system to change. Remember, there was a company in, this, in, in the world called Kodak. Kodak, a very huge company. Today, where is Kodak? Because they did not pick up when it mattered most. And I can give you a series of companies that has gone down. Recently, we had Nokia. Nokia was the pride of phones to use a few years ago. They, they, they did not pick up the changes in the, in the, in the environment. And today, Nokia is, is no more. So we have realized that over time, systems are changing, and they are changing so fast in technology, so fast, that when you don't come on board with it, you'll be left behind. And inefficiency. The system might be working all right, but it may not be efficient. Efficiency means that the resources you have and how you're going to use it, are you going to maximize the, your, 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 your <coughs> advantages? We've done all these analysis and think that the system that is in place now at the EC is not fit for purpose. So there's the need to change. Because you're talking about, the, you're saying that it may work, it may be working perfectly, it be working. but it's not efficient and all e of that. The exactly. question then is, would it be prudent then to conduct this, you know, the compilation in an election year, and I'm coming to the timing issue and the practicality of it. So if it's usable to the extent that, yes, we've been able to use it for the 2016 elections and subsequent, you know, referendum and uh, unit committee elections and all, then what, what is the pressing need to have it done in an election year? Well, you do I recall that Osir uh, Kwame, when he was speaking, I think he, he broached the issue, but we'll be going on there subsequently, where he talked about the fact that in 2012, this, I mean, there was a new voters register compiled, but the preparation started earlier. So you're talking about more time as against our limited time. So I, I just want us to look at the time yeah, initially. Yeah, 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 because yeah, at yeah. the end of it all, it boils down now to how practical it is for the EC to carry through with its plans, because that's the decision that they have taken. It, it, yes, yes. You may have a point that, well, let's worry about the timing. But it's whose decision to worry? The EC, and you're asking about the processes. The EC did not, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I don't speak for the EC. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just happen to share their views. In 2012, when we raised the issue, the issue didn't share our view. 
they shared the view of the of the of the of the NDC, okay, and went ahead with the with, um, with the with the election without the new voters register. We won the election, so we are not doing this because we, we think that that is what is going to help us win twenty twenty. You mean in twenty sixteen? Yes, we, yes, mm -hmm. twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. We want we want we want the twenty sixteen mm -hmm. election, I, even without the voters register being changed. So. We are not doing this, or we are not supporting this, the idea of changing the voters' register, because we think that that is what is going to inure to our winning 2020 election. In fact, after 2020 election, winning 2020 election, I think that... No, but my question is, if it's about the efficiency of it, yeah. or the, 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 the quest to have it more efficient, yeah. question then is... So presumably, then it can be used. It's just that we would need to make it more efficient. So the question is, then why don't we use it for 2020 and then give ourselves some more time, deal with the efficiency of it? Because you're not talking, it's efficiency as against effective. Currently, it is effective from your submissions. It works from it, your it, submission. It it's just that it's just, not efficient. I'm, I'm, I'm making a point, maybe if you, help, if, you, if you allow me. It works. Everything works. Let's go to the ports. I'm doing a research at the port. We had a system in place that worked. You bring your item and you can clear. It may take how many months, but you can, if the point is that you can clear it. Mm -hmm. The NDC started trying with the paperless. They went on and on and on and on, but there was no political will to push the agenda. When we came into office, September 1st, we said no. This is not good. If it is not good, why do you do? Why do you continue to use it if it is not fit for purpose? Because it is working. We, we don't do things because it is working. I just gave you two examples. No, but we are but, looking at the context here. That's why I'm saying yeah, we're it, looking at the context here, and the, the context here has to do with the time factor. The, you see, the time Some factor. Some have raised the issue that, given see, the 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 level of you know disagreement, and looking at the time that we have. Going through with this might raise or generate chaos. So, question is: Are, you, are we are willing you, to put you, ourselves I, I, through I, that? I, 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 am, I am very, very uncomfortable when the argument comes with because electoral commission wants to take a decision, there will be chaos. I don't. I, I really don't get that argument. But be it that it may, that is what they want. They have already told us that they were going to make this country ungovernable. So, I am not surprised at the tangent they are going. But let's let me let me finish. They're only exercising their let democratic me, rights. Fine, fine. But yeah, exercise your democratic mm. rights, but not make the country ungovernable. Now, let me let me end with the, the system analysis. So, you analyze the system, and you are not saying that the system is not is not working, but it is not efficient. It is expensive. To even maintain. Look, we are the electoral commission, my colleagues are happily <coughs> flagging the issue of cost. They have never told us that the current system as it is now, to maintain the current system, the electoral commission would and Ghanaian would have to cover four million dollars a month to maintain it. Four million dollars a month to maintain it. Now this four million dollars a month, do the calculations from two thousand and and twelve when we did this to now. Do the calculation and see how much money we've put in place just to maintain it. Look, planes, planes are, 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 are grounded, not because they cannot fly. Planes are grounded because new technology has come and it is no more efficient. Very well. We're currently looking at the debate over the EC's decision to um, compile a new voters register and also procure um, a new um, biometric system. Um, during the week, a number of press conferences were held where uh, two coalition of political parties stated their respective positions for and against. And in the studio this morning, we have representatives of the NPP and the NDC obviously representing those two coalitions and the, po the positions of those two coalitions. So we are still delving deeper into the issues. Before the break, um, Mr. Fred, Mankwa Safo was making his submissions. I'll quickly turn to you now to wrap up on that for me and then... Right, yeah. so um, you have... The Electoral Commission says it has done its system analysis, it has done its audits, and thinks that there's the need to have a new biometric regist register. From professional points, now, if my biometric data was taken in 2008, it is not going to change. It is not going... My biometric features will not change until... It was taken in 2012. 2012. It's not going to change. And so the data for my biometric features 
if it is intact, there is no need for me to go and queue and have the But same you need pages. to go there to be sure that it's, it's in there it. in the first place. Yeah, we, you we, can't just yeah. sit home and assume it's not in there it's, or it's in exactly. there. Exactly. But the, po the point is that now they are making an, uh, uh, an, an uh, that if the, if the um, DVDs are what we should do, then let's change that, the, the, let's buy the equipment. But buying the equipment also means that you have to migrate the data onto. Is it possible? Can we confidently say that it is possible to migrate the data that we have onto a new BVD system? If it is possible, let's look at that option. But the Electoral Commission says it is not possible. It might even be more expensive. It's just like you have you use um, 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 you are using an I, uh, <coughs> iPad, right? It's an, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Apple. Laptop. You are using an you are using an, you are using an uh, Apple, Apple laptop. If, I, if I'm using um, another laptop, even sometimes communicating becomes, a, becomes difficult. Now, let me look at the legal also. Now, the legal point is that the Electoral Commission does not need anybody's permission to conduct its services. In fact, IPAC is not a creature of the Constitution. The Constitution mandates the EC to compile and protest register as and when it deems fit. You talk about op opinions. We can all share our opinion. But the Constitution and the law does not ask the EC to come and ask anybody. You mentioned IPAC. IPAC you mentioned is not, IPAC. It's not a creation of the Constitution, yes, that's it is true. Not. But it has become a part at of any, our processes. At, at any, and to, it's, it's always engaged. And you, you know that processes at IPAC are you see, uh, by reason of consensus. And you. that is one of the things thank that you. we need to advance we in our democratic We need to advance it uh, journey. By, by reason of consensus. But at yes. the end of the day, somebody must take the decision. Mm -hmm. And if they need law. But are you saying there's been a consensus on this? this, there, on this if debate? there's no consensus, if there's no consensus, what happens? Consensus means that you agree with me what I want to do. If you don't agree with me, with what I would do? But that do. which would help with a consensus building, for instance, in this case, is what the NDC is saying here, that, well, yes, we are willing to hear you out on this argument of a certain cost element. Let's see the reports that suggest that it will be more costly to refurbish than that. They say that they haven't received any reports. Do you have that report, for instance, I, the I, MPP? I, I have you not, been given I, that? I, I or you, you still insist that the, N, the have, EC does not I don't, have you to? You see, the NDC has a position when it comes to the biometric registration, new biometric registration. They have a position, and they are defending their position. I have a position. I'm defending my position. The, the, the body that is mandated constitutionally to take the decision is the Electoral Commission. So, yes, that, and the I, Electoral I, I Commission get that. is taking its decision. I get that. I get that. I'm not trying. I'm not are we, are we in supposed any to way. Them? I'm not in any way suggesting that. But to the extent that the IPAC was set up for a purpose, and in fact, in recent times, there's been another body set up by the, 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 the um, Electoral Commission. Yeah. Obviously, not a constitutional body as well. But the EC set that up for a purpose to advise, to help with all sorts of things. Question then is what would be the essence of that body if a, a couple of years time we, we turn around and say, well, that body was not constitutionally mandated or constitutionally set up and so we cannot be. You see, if the EC take... The process so far in the country since 1992 has been that political parties work with the EC in a certain way, which we have become accustomed to. So to suggest that, well, we can bulldoze our way by reason of the fact that we are I, an independent I, body. I, I think that I, would I, not I not, I am not be suggesting that we can taste. bulldoze our way. This EC has also constantly engaged the political parties. But when it comes to issues of decision making, it is left to the EC to take. The fact that we have an advisory committee or advisory body doesn't mean that if I have to take a decision, I have to take your opinion and leave my opinion or go by what you say. So if I don't go by what you say, the country must go in flames. That is, see, that is where my concerns are. Now, the politics of it, let's come to the politics of it. In 2012, when we pushed for new voters register, it was refused. The politics of it, we went on demonstration <coughs> and we had the police unleashed on us. We were beaten. In fact, we had one person die. Now, the then president told Ghanaians that we should allow the Electoral Commission the peace of mind to, 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 to conduct his constitutional mandate. Which is what you're telling us now. Ex exactly. So that is the politics but of it. But if it was bad then, I, I'm it not can saying, be good I, now. I, I, politics is not bad. I'm not saying... I, I, just, I just said the thing. I just 
started with the system, mm -hmm. with the legal, and with the politics of it. So the system, we can have issues. The legal, nobody can, nobody can share the mandate of the electoral <coughs> commission. And then the politics of it is also that if you claim that the electoral commission should be allowed, when we when we're making this statement, the electoral commission, the law that mandates the electoral commission to, to act was still there. The IPAC was still there. Advisory committee and civil society organizations were all there. Everybody raised its issues. The electoral commission was the, had the final bite to take a decision. In fact, the electoral commission should, is not mandated to listen to anybody. Mm -hmm. If they so desire and think that what they are doing is right, and they have not gone against any law in this country, then we are good to go. If they have done something against the law of this country, what do we do? You don't cure Ill illegality with an illegality. You go to court. You go to restrain the electoral commission from Last taking the decision. Last before I move yes. to Mr. Um, here. So question is about the report. You think the EC does not have to make that report available, the report that would inform, I mean, all sides as to why it is that we are choosing one approach and not the other. And this year, this approach or this question has to do with the cost element. They say that it would cost more to refurbish than to acquire a new one. According to some advice that have been given, question then is, has the report been made available? I don't have, as I sit now, I don't have the report. But, but you, you don't think it should be made available The electoral commission, oh, well, let the electoral commission so deem to make it available, why not? It is important that we see what is in there, yes. so that we can all put so that our advice. We, can, we can all yes. put our advice in there. But I, I shudder to think that the synopsis of the issue that the Electoral Commission has raised over the time, it is coming from this same report. My colleagues say they don't agree with it, and that the country should burn, should the yes. Electoral Commission should Go, go, should the electoral commission go ahead? The with what they, oh, they just they just said that. They're not saying the we, 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 listen, we listen to the the the, the, the <clears throat> date right now that you played. When they were having their meeting, they said so many things. Somebody no, said we should be doing, be. we should be using common sense. <clears throat> we should be using common sense, and that we are making creatures of of, of we are we, we are getting uh, institutions to be to 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 to, to work. Without, without legal <coughs> mandate. This is not, it's not, it's not the right thing. Uh, I was like, your, your, your response to that? Yes. You said you have a few responses. I have a few responses to what my brother has uh, said. First of all, let me correct the cost of one, uh, $4 million per month. It is actually $3.9 million a year. It's not for me. It's important that, uh, I don't know whether where he, he's picking his source from, but it's important that that should be, that to be clarified. That is <coughs> $3.9 million a year, 12 months, not one month, $4 million to maintain. And that is to maintain <coughs> the, not only the system, but also the wide area network that supports the system and links it to all the districts. It's important to do, note, uh, make that clear. The other thing is that my brother has mentioned efficiency and from that, I would like to quote two sources to indicate how efficient and accurate the current system is. One is from the new patriotic party's petition that they presented to the Electoral Commission on the 25th of July, 2015, where they indicated that out of 14.8 million people that have been registered, they exist 2,096 people who they alleged had double registration in the system. And therefore, uh, I mean, who they indicated more or less went through the system undetected as double registration. That, that is a figure that represents 99.99% uh, accuracy of the biometric system when it comes to registration. And double registration? Yes. But how does, how does that ref reflect efficiency? Well, I will come to that. Okay. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with accuracy. I'm, accuracy, sorry. That's what I mean. How does that reflect accuracy if there's been double registration? You see, the, the accepted uh, going into the system, the accepted accuracy was 99.98. Okay. So more or less, the system has uh, exceeded that. <coughs> and, and all the biometric systems we have all across the world, from the major biometric companies, 
if you can boast of this level of accuracy, then you have a very good system. It is important to note that because we work with standards. The other and that was in 2015. That was in 2015. And they are saying now that the systems have reached uh, their end, sub, end of support life. So 2015, no, I'll, 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 and now we are talking about four or five years down I'll, the lane. And this technology we're talking about. I'll, so I'll, I'll come to that. Those people we are talking about still exist in the system. I mean, not, not the double registration. That one, the EC took you mm -hmm. know, note of that and then dealt with it. But it's, we are talking about almost 15 million. Now we are about 16 point something million. So there's no change. That would warrant you know, the throwing away of the system. Let me also deal with, because there are two ways with which the biometric system can be measured mm -hmm. in terms of accuracy and efficiency. I've dealt with the registration and I quoted the new patriotic party's petition. I would also want to <coughs> talk about accuracy in terms of verification. Mm. And that accuracy in terms of verification, I will refer you to page six of the Electoral Commission's press conference that they made. Which, which date? Uh, tw t on the 31st of December, 2019. Mm -hmm. This is just a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And in that press conference, they indicated that they verified the fingerprint verification system verified accurately 5,431,902 people who voted. And people that could not be verified using the biometric system, who they knew before they went into the election anyway, because the system clearly marks people who cannot be verified face only. Mm -hmm. People who also verified <coughs> manually are 34,843. And let me state that this represents, the manual verification represents 0.6%. Mm. Now, what that means is that the accuracy of the verification system is 99.4%. <coughs> now, so this here, statistics, and let me refer you to the unique idea of India, which is more or less the most boasted about biometric system in the world because they pick fingerprint, and then they pick iris. So a lot of the ID conferences you go around the world will refer you to uh, the unique ID system. Mm. The least error rate I have heard with the unique ID system is 4%. We don't even have 1% error rate. You know, and let me also put it this way, to use the actual technical term, the exclusion rate, people who are excluded, excluded from the biometric verification. Okay, good. Now, having said that, let me also go, so in terms of efficiency, we have one of the best in the world. I am going to state that very clearly. The next thing I want to talk about is the bloated register issue that my brother has raised. Now, before I answer that question, I would like to go back to how this biometric system started in 2009, after the 08 elections. It was started by the new patriotic party, the idea of a biometric system, and the current president, Nana Adodankwa Akufuado. When they proposed that Ghana should look at biometric technology, the reasons they gave was that one, Biometric technology, especially the fingerprint, was permanent in the sense that when you are in the sixth month of the fetus in the, your mother's womb, your fingerprints are set in stone and they don't change until you die. Current scanners can pick them at age about age <coughs> six because that is when it actually matures. So from you, the, your mother's womb to you die, those fingerprints will not, uh, details will not change. Okay. That is one of the reasons. The other reason that the new patriotic party and the current president made was that the issue of ghost names of the register will become irrelevant if we go biometric because those ghosts cannot bring their fingerprint to come and verify. And therefore, when we go biometric, even if ghost names exist on the register, they cannot be used on the day of election. I support that, that idea, mm -hmm. that ghost names cannot be verified. And true, true, we have only 
34 people who even verified manually. And there is a system in place that allows them to do that. So the issue of bloated register, the proper cure of the bloated register is to have a functioning birth and death registry that is linked to the various identity systems that exist in this country so that there is automated deletion from the register. We haven't gotten there. As I speak to you now, birth and death is covering only 17% of deaths, which means if 100 people die, only 17 of them are see, recorded. Mr. Sekwame, in that same statement you're referring to, the EC statement, they do state here that, um, let me quote, it says that it's a well-known fact mm -hmm. that the register is bloated and there has not been an effective means of cleaning it. So the fact of the bloatedness of the register is, unless you're saying it's not the case. Okay, in answer to that, now that they are going to do a new biometric system, how do they intend to deal with the bloating of the register? Because even if you register in January this year, and you go into the elections in December, we will have people who are deceased on the register. You see, the point is, and at what cost? Are you going to keep changing the red? Like I told you, Nanado Dankwa Akufuado and his MPP making a pitch for the new biometric register said that it was necessary to have a permanent register because the biometric nature of the fingerprint allows us to do that. You understand? And then also, the, if there is people, deceased people on the register, those people are unable to vote. I want my brother or so, the MPP to tell me how somebody who is dead can bring a, his fingerprint to come and vote on the election day. I mean, of course, of and, course. And then again, let no, me also we, say this. We need to be wrapping up because be, be, we're, be, be, we're before, out of time. Before but I, I think that conversation here, I mean, the conversation here definitely will carry on. But I think we need to have a forward-looking approach, which is how do we ensure that we get to a point where, yes, there will be names of deceased persons on there, but we, we are able to get them off the register. So at any given time, there's that, in, I mean, in, in, interconnectedness with, for instance, the death registry. So there's, there's a death, it's registered. Then some way, somehow, you are the IT people, it would be indicated, and then we can rate the register of such names. And that essentially is the way to go. Right. Otherwise, we would always have the need to compile new registers, new registers, new registers. To what end? Is it sustainable? It's not. So for me, I think when wrapping up, let's look at the forward going or forward looking approach. Because this debate, we'll have it over and over again, is endless. So in a, in a minute, forward looking, and then I go to well, Fred, uh, forward looking approach. How do we do? Well, to, to support what you have said, during the administration of uh, His Excellency John Dranmani Mahama, there was a policy initiative that pointed Ghana towards first of all, resourcing birth and death registry, because that is important. The MPP in their petition cited South Africa and Kenya. These are countries that have a very vibrant birth. In fact, South Africa has the highest level, one of the highest level of uh, birth registry coverage, death coverage in the world. You see, it's important to resource birth and death registry so that it is autom automatically linked to the numerous uh, biometric mm. system we have in Nekas. Mm. But then again, when it comes to civil biometric system, every country needs one. As a nation, we have mm. 10 of them. We have 10. And, I, and the, the, the most sobering aspect of it is that most of the time, we have bought the license more than once. We bought it twice. Fair Bank enough. of Ghana bought a sergeant. If One minute is up. I would have to move. Fred, concluding remarks. Well, How I think that um, deepening democracy mm -hmm. means that we must look at what we have and see going forward. Current systems across the globe is moving towards smartness. So if you are not using smart technology, you are being left behind. It is even going to be more expensive to even transmit data. Because if you're using a Pentium 2, for example, and somebody is using i7, sending data across the globe will be more efficient using the, the, the current technology. We should get to a position where multiple um, biometric cards that, is, that we are using, we should all come, we should coalesce all of them into one. So that, for example, if it's the NIE, let all of us use the NIE. But there too, my yeah. colleagues in the, in the NDC 
kicked against it. That's so this right. is a, I, this is this, this, I, this I, is the situation we, we, where we need to we need to we need to you kick against everything. We kick against the omission of the voters register. You kick against it. As a piece of register. Fred Amankwasa, who is a member of the National Communications Team of the NPP, and Ms. Lose Kwame Griffiths, he's a director of IT with the NDC. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been it's been nice having you here. We'll be back here same time next week. I'm sure that you have yourselves a very good weekend and a productive week ahead of you. Bye bye. <laughs>